If you always wanted to start your very own podcast, but didn't really know where to start, well, then this episode is for you. It's all about the basics of podcasting, podcasting 101, so to speak, and how you can launch your very own. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and of course, your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. Today, I sit down with Sarah St. John. She is the author of Frugalpreneur, has a blog also called Frugalpreneur, and a podcast, you guessed it, called Frugalpreneur. And she dives deep into the very basics that, of what you need to do in order to start your very own podcast. If you haven't already, please go ahead and pound that subscribe button so you get notified when new episodes air every Friday. And without further ado, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Silicon Alley Podcast featuring the Sarah St. John. Are you interested in growing and scaling your business? Welcome to the Silicon Alley Podcast, where you'll hear from entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and top performers on what it truly takes to grow and scale a business. You'll walk away with actionable insights you can apply in your own business and life. Now to William Glass, the CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. Sarah, welcome to the Silicon Alley Podcast. Super excited to have you on today. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm excited to dive in as someone who brands themselves as the frugalpreneur and has a, a podcast by that name. And I'm really excited to dive into bootstrapping and, and all the different things that you can do in terms of building a business on a tight budget. But would love to get a little background on you, Sarah, and kind of open up to the audience as to who you are if they're not familiar. Sure. Yeah. So I started my entrepreneurial journey probably over a decade ago. 2008 is when I really started. I had had six different jobs that year, not at the same time, but throughout the course of the year and realized that I wanted to be my own boss. And so I started a photography business and I realized that while I like taking photos of animals and landscapes and architecture, I didn't like taking photos of people, but that's where the money is. I was doing weddings and portraits. But the bigger issue than that was actually just the expense to maintain and, you know, equipment and software and all that stuff. So I decided to switch to an online business model, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I tried a bunch of different things like affiliate marketing, drop shipping, blogging. And it was in that process that I discovered all these free or affordable tools, resources, and software to run a business on a budget. And so I decided to, or I got the idea to write a book called Frugalpreneur uh, that kind of covers like the different online business models and how to run them on a budget. And then while I was writing that, I got the idea to start a podcast to coincide with the book, um, also called Frugalpreneur, but it was just going to be, you know, like 10 episodes or something, an extra marketing outlet, I guess. But I was getting more traction and leverage with the podcast and the book. And I love the connections I was making. So I kept doing that. I've been doing that for a couple of years now. I have almost 90 episodes. And I've been producing my own podcast all along the way and enjoy it. And I decided, well, why not launch a podcast production agency and get paid to do it for other people? And now I'm working <laughs> on a podcasting course. And so I'm kind of all in on podcasting, but it took over a decade of trying this, that, and the other thing before I finally landed on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a journey and sounds like you've ran the gamut of, of ways to build out businesses online. Going back, what motivated you to make that leap? You said you'd had six different jobs that year and wanted to, to take over your own, I guess, schedule in life through entrepreneurship. Like, What was the impetus though to really make that leap? Have you always been an entrepreneur at heart? I feel like I have been. It was one of those things where I didn't really realize until I started doing entrepreneurship and then kind of looking back on my life and realizing, oh, I think it's always been there. Because when I was a kid, I would gather up stuff that I got for free, like candy or pencils or whatever, and sell them to my friends and <laughs> just different things like that. But I guess I didn't really make the connection I just kind of went along with the expectation of going to college I only got as far as an associate's degree in journalism but <laughs> um, but you know just kind of followed that path 
that's expected and didn't really think about entrepreneurship I guess maybe it was just buried or suppressed or something until <laughs> I had had a few jobs <laughs> after college and was like, mm, I don't know about this. <laughs> yeah, just over time developing that interest and in going back to the kid, being able to, to sell free things mm-hmm. that you got and make some cash that way. So you started off in photography, realized that wasn't going to scale and man, people are a lot harder to take pictures of than landscapes and sculptures and they're much more demanding. So talk me through the journey of all these different things that you tried from affiliate marketing and blogging and pod, like talk to me about like that journey and what you've learned. Cause it sounds like you've tried most, most everything in terms (laughs) of ways to make money online. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, f- I feel like I have. So after the photography business, I tried a bunch of different things. Like I still do some affiliate marketing, but I did have a drop shipping business, which uh, what I liked about that was that you didn't have to have an inventory. Mm-hmm. So there's still very little overhead, but depending on what you're drop shipping, I mean, I was doing baby onesies. And so the average sale is what I, I mean, I was make, maybe making like 20 bucks profit or something per sale. And it was just kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> Small margins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then blogging, I didn't do a whole lot. Um, okay. But, you know, tried to uh, incorporate affiliate marketing with that, but I do affiliate marketing with through the podcast like if I have an author on Mm -hmm. in the show notes I'll link to their book or you know something like that or if they own a software program you know something like that but um let's see I did print on demand which is kind of like drop shipping but I was creating my own designs and things like that I had learned throughout that process like what what were some of the things from the drop shipping print on demand like what it sounds like the margins are really small like what made Mm. you move away from it Yeah, the margins are small and it's hard to, I mean, first of all, you have to run ads pretty much to get traffic. So then your profit margin's even smaller and like to compete with Amazon. (laughs) Yeah, it's difficult. (laughs) I, I know there are people who do it successfully, but I realized that it wasn't my passion oh i also had an online travel agency which actually did pretty well had that for about five years while i was kind of doing this that and the other thing on top of it and i thought that that was where i was going to end up you know stick with that the problem was especially with covid so i closed that up like a month after covid hit because all my bookings got canceled. And the thing with a travel agency is you don't get paid until the person completes their trip, basically. And so <laughs> I did a bunch. So I did a bunch of, you know, work researching and booking all this stuff for people, but then never got paid on it because they didn't get to take their trips. And so I was like, oh, plus I was really getting into podcasting and enjoying that. And, and so I was already thinking about stopping the travel agency and going all in on podcasting but then when COVID hit I was in all of that that entailed I was like okay now's the time to close up shop on that makes sense so so talk to me a little bit more about the podcast Frugalpreneur you have a book by the same name and Mm -hmm. the podcast sounds like kind of accidentally spurted from the book Mm -hmm. talk to me about the podcast and how everything's going yeah yeah so it was accident in a way I mean I guess it was intentional that I started one but that wasn't something I was planning from the get-go and I wasn't planning on it being a long-term thing (laughs) I just love the connections that I'm making like meeting people like you and I actually recently interviewed Pat Flynn I'm assuming you know who he is yeah yeah I was looking on YouTube earlier and saw that you did that you the interview there so Yeah, so just like getting to, well, maybe not technically meet, like not in person or not right now anyway, meet these people, but like being able to talk with people and 
you know, even people I didn't know before podcasting, just interesting people and their stories. I feel like with podcasting, you're almost kind of getting like a one-on-one consultation in a way yeah. and, and learning. And then that person might know someone who might know someone and it just kind of snowballs, I feel like. So I, I've just loved it and found like people find you easier, I feel like, with podcasting than maybe blogging or even YouTube or whatever else. I'm a, obviously I'm a big fan of podcasting. hence why we're here. <laughs> right. Uh, and I completely agree. It's a great way to connect with people. What are some of the things, so whether it's from the conversation with Pat or just in general, like what are some of the things that you've learned or taken away from some of your conversations with people that have built businesses with little to, to no money? Oh, Wow. So originally when I started the podcast, I was interviewing CEOs or founders or people within companies of like various software programs that I use that are Mm. free or affordable. Then I kind of started interviewing people that I admired or looked up to in various niches within entrepreneurship, whether it was podcasting or affiliate marketing or whatever and then this year I started interviewing people who started their business with less than a thousand dollars and built it to at least seven figures in any time frame it doesn't matter what the time frame was but without any kind of like outside capital or loans or credit or investments or whatever and so I've learned some really interesting or heard some interesting stories from some of those people. Like one guy I interviewed who, when I was looking at my statistics, actually I have currently the most downloads on his episode. I don't even know if people know who he is, but he came from Africa and came to America with only a hundred dollars and has built three different businesses to seven figures by all bootstrap and so just in his process was that so I guess here's one thing I learned was that his process was he would try to remember what his first business was I think it was building websites or something and you know you start that for hardly anything and then as he started getting income then he would spend like maybe 2000 that he earned and then he bought a camera and then he started doing photography. It seems to be a common <laughs> thing that people try where he could charge $2,000 per wedding or whatever he was doing mm-hmm. with just a $2,000 investment. So one gig, you know, canceled that out. Then he would take money he earned from that and then he would invest in something else. And now he has a software company that's, kind of like an all-in-one business management platform and then let's see someone else I interviewed recently she a lot of these people are immigrants actually she came from Germany and started a business bootstrapped it and one of her businesses it was actually also photography whatever (laughs) (laughs) a lot of photographers yeah but her particular type of photography was like for magazines like vogue and stuff like that and she was able to sell her photography business to bill gates for seven figures but i'm just like (laughs) <laughs> or she she started in debt actually 135,000 in debt bootstrapped sold a company to Bill Gates for <laughs> seven figures now she has like a coaching business and whatnot and yeah just different stories like that it's inspiring to know that other people have done this and you can do it it just takes determination and hustle and resource like just being creative, I guess, in a way of how to kind of the almost like stepping stones or building blocks. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And it's really, yeah, really interesting to hear other people that have bootstrapped. And, you know, I think that's 
obviously a, a very attractive, attractive model, especially because most people don't have a ton of money that they can throw at a business or trying to create something because they need to pay a bill or X, Y, and Z, you know, whatever, whatever the motivation is. So, you know, being able to lean on and see other people that have been able to do it and know that it's possible to build, build businesses with little to no capital, Mm -hmm. it's very important to talk about and share those stories. When you think about what you want people to take away when they listen to an episode, what is it that you want people to come away feeling or knowing, or what action should they be taking after they hear uh, an episode? So I guess with episodes like that, it would be inspiration. And there's usually in those episodes, the person I'm interviewing usually gives kind of a strategy or tips or something that someone can implement or consider. And then if it's an episode where I'm interviewing someone who's an expert in some area of entrepreneurship or maybe they work for a particular software company of something that I use and recommend just taking away a lot of times people haven't even heard of these platforms that are free or really affordable. They've heard of competitors that are expensive, but they haven't heard about (laughs) these, these just as good, if not better, like free or affordable options. And so a lot of people I've heard like, they'll be taking notes like, Oh, I got to check that out. I got to check that out. And then they sign up for it and whatnot. And um, so I guess just like, I feel like in the process of writing the book and then the goal of the podcast is saving people time by them not having to research these types of things. Like every day I feel like I'm online looking for new tools, resources, and (laughs) software to try out or to recommend. And so I think it it does save people time. Well, people might not even spend the time anyway to look up all that stuff and do comparisons and whatnot, but I like doing it. So <laughs> there you go. yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah. Being able to save people time or depending on, like you said, the type of the episode, whether it's strategies or tips from guests mm-hmm. of how they can, how they were successful in implementing it, it makes a ton of sense. Mm-hmm. Sarah, in terms of, of pod team, how did you develop the business and talk to me a little bit about going from producing your own show, learning all about all these tools and resources, sharing them with, with other frugalpreneurs how did you end up starting Podscene? So I've always produced my own show and people would compliment me on it say that it was, you know, for doing it myself, that it was done pretty well. So then I got the idea and then I implemented it by, I mean, there's so many tools that I use myself for my own show, whether, and I'll, I can just list some of them. So like uh, a Descript is a good one for creating transcripts or even I like to edit my audio and or, and or video through Descript because you can edit out, you can remove filler words in a, with a click of a button. So basically you edit the audio or video by editing the transcript. So you can remove ums and uhs and things like that. And then you can even create like audiograms in there now, which I also use Headliner or Repurpose.io. Those two I use for audiograms. So before I started doing video podcasts and it was just audio, I would create through Repurpose a, a long form audiogram where it turns it into a video better than nothing I guess but now I'm starting to do like video podcasts like kind of like we're, what we're doing and then put that on YouTube and then take the audio from that and turn that into the podcast and then like caption social media like where it has clips of the interview but it's like caption because a lot of people when they're on social media they they're in a situation at work or wherever where they can't listen to it so the captions you can read it as as it's playing without hearing it 
And there's something called Clip Scribe for that. And then I create graphics in Canva. I mean, all these things are either free or really affordable. And so, and, and there's some others I can't think of at the moment, but basically just using all these tools and then it's like other people wouldn't have to pay for these tools and they could just pay me to use these tools to create their <laughs> but then also what I've discovered is that it isn't really starting or recording a podcast that people have an issue with it's the post-production mm-hmm. And that's why so many people pod fade. That's the term used like when people usually on average only put out seven to 10 episodes and then they just, they're like, forget it. (laughs) Because of all the post-production, people don't think about that when they start like the editing production, the intros, the outros, if you want ads put in, if which I don't personally do, but some people do. Mm -hmm. And then the audiograms, transcripts, show notes, social graphics just it's a everything lot. <laughs> and some people don't do any of that but i recommend if you wanted to sound the best and make the most impact or reach the most people or or whatever i recommend doing all those things and so basically the way pod scene works is that when someone just records their episode whether it's audio or video sends it to me and then i do all the post-production back-end stuff so then it's it's a lot less likely that they'll pod fade if all they have to do is record the episode yeah, that that makes it a lot easier i mm-hmm. as someone who has is self-produced <laughs> i can i can second that it takes a lot of time and effort and things that you don't realize and it's not easy so i see the value in Podseam and what you're doing. And I was not aware of a lot of those tools. Um, Some of them I've used like Headliner and Canva, Uh but I never heard of Descript. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, Descript will pretty much change your life. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like it. They do have a free plan, but it's limited. Like only, I mean, you might be able to use it for a month or two. But the the plan that I'm on is only $15 a month. And I'm thinking about switching to the the $30 a month plan because of what it offers. But it's very, it's one of the very few things that I actually pay for (laughs) (laughs) to run my business, but it's, uh, it's a big time saver. Oh, absolutely. I think the editing process is, is, uh, is definitely one of the, the biggest time sucks, I would say. Mm-hmm. Even if it's not necessarily hard, it's a lot of time. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think I've noticed that for every hour episode or so that I have, it takes anywhere from three to five hours for all the back end stuff. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot. So Sarah, what what would you, if you were advising someone who's just starting a podcast or want to start a podcast, like what steps should they take? Like what, what are your thoughts around, around that for a newbie? So they don't pod fade. Yeah. Uh, Well, the first thing is to find a niche. There are some podcasts out there where they talk about anything and everything, but very few people can pull that off and so it needs to be niche down but a very specific topic and audience and then have some kind of clever I suppose name but something that people can tell what it means by by reading it I like you the title of your show it's Silicon Alley and you know people think of Silicon Valley and so I thought that was creative so a creative title that tells people what it's about some people want to name their show after them but unless they're well known like unless you're oprah or something i don't recommend saying (laughs) the your name show or whatever and then as far as like cover art definitely something that pops out not a whole bunch of words i guess you could have your face on it if you don't use your na- i think if you use your name like the so and so show and have your face on it if no one knows who you are then that's just you ev- it's a lot yeah <laughs> yeah i think yours has your face on it but it also has it has a building of some sort i can't remember Oh, was it the flat it's got iron? The flat iron. Oh, yeah, okay. it's the flat iron and uh, the the clock that's in front of the building. Oh, okay, yeah. 
so yeah having some kind of image like that i think is good um and if you're gonna put your face on it and that's all that's on it ideally it would be a cart like kind of a cartoon i think those pop better than someone's actual face but each to their own um and of course with your title i think it's good to say whatever your title is with so and so like your name and then okay so those are just some kind of basics to get started and then you need a podcast host there are a couple of free ones but i personally recommend one I, I recommend that this is one of the areas that you actually pay for. I use Captivate, which is like 19 bucks a month. And they're really good. You can have unlimited podcasts and all this stuff. They have a lot of like marketing tools within it. But there's a lot of good ones out there like Buzzsprout. It's pretty good. So yeah, usually you can get hosting for under $20 a month. And then as far as equipment, getting started you technically could use your like what you have your earbuds with you know, apple earbuds with the little mic that's built in um and <laughs> oh that's just so you can hear okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i try not to i unfortunately sometimes i have caught myself post production that i did record with this oh, uh-huh. and you'll hear the the little oh. it'll hit the collar <laughs> oh okay but, yeah y- yeah, so I recommend a mic. I have an ATR2100, which was like 60 or 80 bucks. There's also Samsung Q2U, which is about the same. And then it's a USB mic, plug it right into your computer. And then like what you're doing and what I'm doing, using some kind of earbuds or headphones so that when you're listening to the person, so that it doesn't come through the computer and cause an echo. I would say those are like starting out those are the areas that you want to first focus on and invest in if you want to go completely free you could use your earbuds for both the listening and the recording if you wanted to and use like anchor for your hosting but i would say if you have like a hundred bucks and a hundred bucks to start with get a mic and you probably have headphones or earbuds laying around um and and then if you have twenty dollars a month, then you know get a, a podcast hosting platform. Why why the hosting do you think it's important to pay for versus using like an anchor or one of the other free tools? Yeah, so I think anchor has improved, but I know the issue with them, and maybe this is the issue with any free one, which I'm not sure how many are actually totally free but yeah it might uh, be one of the few wordpress i think you can use some plugins wordpress plugins uh, and host it on your own website but you still pay for mm. the website hosting so i don't know if it's really free yeah yeah that's probably the last way <laughs> recommended <laughs> yeah. way to do it but as far as i think the issue with anchor in the beginning was that and maybe they still do this i don't know is that like at least for apple podcasts when they distribute it it's like through their account you don't do it through yours and so any kind of changes or any kind of you want to if you want to log in look at your analytics or whatever you don't have access to that and then if you try change it's apparently a big mess (laughs) and then plus i think like maybe they put ads in i'm not sure i know in the beginning i heard negative things and now i hear it's slightly more positive because they've made some changes but yet i don't know (laughs) so i just stay away from it a sounder actually has a free plan and paid plans and spreaker as well i started on spreaker because it's free up to like five hours i don't know if it's five hours a month yeah, it must be five hours total. So you, it doesn't get you very far. But then the paid plan after that was like seven bucks. So that's a little bit cheaper. Or Sounder, they have a free plan. Yes. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> awesome. So any, and then in terms of like, how do I decide if I want to do an interview show or a solo show or a panel or I don't know what are what are the you know how do you figure out what what format to use for the podcast. Yeah, those are the three main types. Um, 
I think the majority of shows are probably interview. And what I like about the interview style is that you get to meet people, connect with people, network with people. But those people could potentially become your clients if it makes sense. Form friendships. They might know so-and-so. that, But then also you're getting someone else's perspective. And so I think for the listeners, it's good because you're getting someone else's perspective and learning from that person. But then for yourself, kind of all the other things I said. With a solo show, the advantage of that and I've done a few solo episodes and I'm thinking about doing more. The advantage is then you're more of the expert because when you have an interview and there's the guest on, they become more of the expert. So they get to really know the guest and not as much the host. So I think really the best way to do it is to do both. Like to have, yeah, to have interviews for the pros of that, but then have the, solo episodes for the pros of that so that you're kind of you're kind of getting the best of both worlds and then as far as like a panel or like a co-hosting or something like that for some people it makes sense but I don't know I feel like with that scenario you're almost getting the worst of both worlds (laughs) and maybe the best I don't know but I've never been interested in that format I think it'd be a lot more to manage with like scheduling and because if you have two hosts and a guest, or if you have like three hosts and no guest or any more than two people, I I don't know. It seems like with scheduling, it would really become (laughs) kind of a nightmare. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Yeah, You have to have like set times of here's when everyone's free and some people that I know that have started off have started off with co-hosts and then they've split and mm. one person's been like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. So you've also got to make sure that the person that you or if you're co-hosting is committed um, or that you're committed if you're, mm. <laughs> you know, that you want to do it that way. So mm-hmm. that's a, another consideration that I've, at least I've seen. Mm-hmm. Sarah, in terms of like success, when you think about the podcast, when you think about pod scene, like what does success look like for you? Like, what is, what does that look like? I think a couple of things, probably the most important actually would be knowing that you're making an impact in some way, shape or form. I think kind of the goal with the podcast that I have is helping people understand or know of different ways to make money online, how to do it affordably on a budget, whether it's something they want to do full-time at some point or just as a side hustle and for extra income with their day job, you know, pointing them to the right types of online businesses, the tools, resources, software to run that. So I think when you, when you get feedback I think that is encouraging and and then I guess another thing would would be on the monetary side of course would be once you start seeing income coming in of some sort <laughs> <laughs> then then that would also be I guess the second thing yeah another sign of success right yeah right, you're providing yeah. an impact and people are whether it's through advertising or affiliates or subscriptions however however the monetization works being able to to see that impact and that people are getting value and want to want to pay and that's coming down to your bottom line as well mm-hmm. right exactly <laughs> So how, how do you recommend people sort through kind of the noise around <laughs> entrepreneurship and creating online businesses? Because there, there are a lot of legitimate ways to make money. And then there's a lot of people out there that are trying to sell get rich quick schemes mm-hmm. or just take advantage of people or make it seem like some of this stuff is a lot easier than it actually is. What are your recommendations for someone that is just trying to navigate this space and, and figure out like who to trust. Mm -hmm. I think one problem most entrepreneurs have, I know I've had uh, is the shiny object syndrome where you start something and then you hear about or think of something else. You're like, Oh my God, just try that. And that's part of the reason I had so many different businesses and it took me so long to actually figure anything out (laughs) I feel like I waste a lot of time was trying 
anything and everything. And so trying to recognize when that happens and reel it in, but then also when you're trying to decide what to do or how to make money online, I would say there's a few things to keep in mind. If there's something that you know you're good at or something that someone or that multiple people have told you that you're good at, that should be a sign that is there a way you can monetize whatever that thing is. And another thing is what is something that you enjoy doing that is maybe just a hobby, but is there a way you could monetize it? Mm -hmm. People make money in the weirdest ways. Like it might be a hobby of some sort and then somehow they're able to maybe teach other people how to do that thing or, you know, maybe there's something that they're making that, that they could then sell to other people. Maybe other people want that thing or they're an expert at something that they could teach. And maybe it's very niche. If someone is into something that surely there's a few other people out there that are into it as well. So just like finding your hobby, what you're good at, what you enjoy doing, what you could see yourself doing long-term or something that people tell you you're good at and finding a way to monetize that thing versus trying this, that, and the other thing. Cause what I found was that I guess I tried a bunch of different things cause I was curious and I just didn't know what would take off, but it was like most of the things I didn't even give it enough time to even see if it would take off. It was, I just lost interest cause it wasn't like a passion or something I was that interested in is more just like getting my feet wet or something like with the drop shipping, for example. And so, but with podcasting, for example, that was something I didn't even, it wasn't like I tried it for the purpose of, I didn't have long-term goals for it. It just, but then I realized how much I liked it and all that stuff. And it became a passion and I guess a hobby in a way. And so I found a way to, a few ways actually, to, to monetize that through the production agency, but just, uh, you know, affiliate marketing or whatever else. And um, so, yeah, I think that those would be things to take into consideration. It's great advice, Sarah. Yeah, thinking about what is it that you enjoy, whether it's a hobby and then kind of focusing on that versus someone says shiny object over here, you should try drop shipping or <laughs> blogging or become a TikTok star and get out, you know, whatever, whatever it is and actually focusing on what it is that, that you enjoy and then kind of what business might, might be the best way to monetize that, that interest. Mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. In terms of your relationship with money. And I'm curious, could you, could you describe what that is? Sure. I grew up in a family that's very frugal and it's not, I mean, back in the day, maybe they probably didn't make much. My parents, they got married young in their late teens, like right out of high school and started having, they had a kid and then we're pretty spaced out, but And then my dad went on, like he has a PhD. And so he went on with schooling for several years. And so I think maybe because they had tight finances because of schooling and being so young and having a kid and all this stuff, they probably had to penny pinch. But now all their kids are out of the house. They're all, they're practically retired or semi-retired you know, their house, you know, all this stuff. And yet they still penny pinch. And so (laughs) I think because I grew up that way, kind of the frugal mindset, I mean, they still use coupons and just all these different things. And so I think that's kind of been my mindset. I don't know if I'm as bad as them, but, (laughs) but, you know, being frugal. And so I kind of incorporate that into the business or a different kind of spin or take on entrepreneurship is that you don't have to have a million dollars to start a business. I mean, well, it depends on what kind of business you have. (laughs) That's why I like online business versus like retail or brick and mortar, because you don't have all that overhead. So I guess it's still kind of 
on the frugal side, but it used to be where any kind of money that I would bring in from business, I felt like I needed to save it or use it for bills and things like that, which I still do to some degree. But now I try to invest more of like what I bring in. I try to invest most of it back into the business so that I'm not really spending out of my pocket per se. I'm just kind of recycling the money, I guess. I still manage my businesses for, well, my goal has always been under a hundred a month, but I think it's actually down to like 40 or 60 a month. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) That's impressive. (laughs) So yeah, I guess that's my take on money. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That frugal focus and Mm -hmm. being able to recycle it in the business. I mean, that's how you grow your business, right? Is obviously it depends on the model, but even whatever the model is, right. And being able to invest that back into whether it's better tools or advertising or marketing or whatever it is to help you continue to grow and grow that revenue stream makes, makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what would you say is the best investment that you've made? Oh, um, well, I suppose in terms of podcasting in particular, I guess it would be a mic, which was a cheap investment. (laughs) Go good returns on that. (laughs) Yeah. I would probably say books. Like I have tons of books. I'm always reading a new book, always business related, but just 10, 20 bucks for a book. And some books you feel like you're getting like a two or $20,000 education. Yeah. So probably various business books. I like that. Yeah. I'm a big reader myself. So I, I love that answer. Are there any in books in particular that stand out as, as ones that you recommend or must reads? Are you familiar with Russell Brunson? I, the name is, I think so, but. He's the click funnels guy. Oh um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't even use his software cause it's like a hundred bucks a month. And since my budget is a hundred <laughs> a month, then that would take it all up. Maybe that sounds silly, but I have his three books, which are really good. Dotcom secrets, expert secrets, and traffic secrets. And they're just so jam packed. Like I've read them both like twice, which I rarely read a book twice. I think any kind of business owner, especially online business owner would get value out of those books. And there's a whole bunch of other books, Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Dad, Poor Dad. Dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. I will teach you to be rich. Mike McCallowitz. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he has a bunch of books. I'm not sure. Uh, Mike McCallowitz. Like Profit First and Fix This Next. Profit First. Oh, are you familiar with John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneurs on Fire? Uh, I I am. I've listened okay. to his to his show, but I'm not. I don't. Does he have books as well? He just came out with one okay. called "Uncommon Path to, Un- to Common Success-, Success" or something along those lines. I- I'm totally messing it up. That's a really good book. It has like 17. Each chapter is a different like thing that he's noticed in all the entrepreneurs he's interviewed. Like that's a recurring thing that that every business should, I guess, implement. And then I've read like Pat Flynn books, like super fans. There's just so many, (laughs) so many good books. Yeah. No, I love that. Yeah. uh, A couple more that I need to add to my list uh, (laughs) that you recommended. So it's not all good, right? We don't always make the best decisions. So what about the flip side? What would you say Mm -hmm. is the dumbest money mistake that you've made? Okay. (laughs) I had forgotten about this. Back when I was trying this, that, and the other thing, I, one of the things I did was became like a white label reseller type thing for some different companies, but it was like a hundred bucks a month just for, to be able to be a reseller. And I was like, okay, this is getting too expensive. (laughs) 
I mean, that works for some people, but for me, I guess it was, I don't know if that was my biggest mistake, but I guess just wasting time and money on a bunch of different business ventures that I, once the website was up, that's about all I did with it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that makes Um, sense. (laughs) Unfortunately, I think uh, a lot of us have those, uh, have those. I know I've got a couple under my belt as well. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) Or just like buying up domains because you like the domain and you think you have an idea for it. But then, but I don't know, sometimes that can be a good thing. Cause one time I bought a domain, uh, preneur press. Cause I, I actually have three books now. They all end in preneur, frugalpreneur, authorpreneur and podcastpreneur. So I created like, I was thinking of having like my own little, self-publishing thing and so i just bought preneur press because it was available never ended up using it and then oh not even a year after i bought it and i bought it for like a buck on i always use one and onecom for my domains it's the number one and one uh because they're like a dollar so i bought it for a buck and then before it was even up for renewal, someone contacted me like a domain broker or whatever and wanted to buy it. And I made like 700 bucks or something. So nice. <laughs> yeah. That's a good return right there. Yeah. yeah 700%. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I guess it's okay to, if you think of a creative domain that, that wasn't my intention to you know sell it when i bought it but since i hadn't started using it and i was like okay sure um i guess that wasn't such a bad way to spend a buck (laughs) yeah no not at all i would say that's good (laughs) so sarah i uh appreciate you coming coming down and sitting down on the podcast, is there any kind of final words of wisdom you want to impart on the audience? And then obviously please let us know how we can reach you. If folks were interested in using a pod seam or just in general, following the podcast, how can folks connect with you offline? One mistake that I've made and sometimes still struggle with is spending so much time learning and not implementing Like I read all these books and watch all these webinars or trainings and listen to all these podcasts and all that stuff's good, especially in the beginning. But at a certain point, if you're not implementing what you're learning, then it's pointless. So for every hour I spend learning, I try to spend another hour implementing. And I think that's kind of a good thing to kind of keep in mind. Like the whole just in time learning. Today I was listening to a podcast and I heard him say, just in case versus just in time. I've always heard of just in time learning where you're learning the thing that you need to know right now, but I had never heard of just in case, which I guess would refer to the type of learning that I've been doing, you know, that I struggle with is like learning all these things just in case I need it. Of course, by the time you need it, you forget it. But anyway, (laughs) (laughs) which is why I've had to read Russell Brunson's books twice. But yeah, as far as finding me, the podcast is called Frugalpreneur, which you can find in any podcast app. You just search for it and it'll come up. Podseam, it's P O D S E A M dot com. I actually give away all three of my books for free, the PDF version at the Sarah St. John dot com forward slash free. And that's Sarah with an H and then S T J O H N. And then, yeah, on my website, I have like, there's a tab up there that says like 27 tools I use. That's all the tools. I actually need to update it because I started using a new one and stopped using one. So I need to switch them out. But (laughs) I usually keep it up to date. But it's all the tools that I use and recommend that are either free or really affordable. Social media everywhere at the Sarah St. John. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for, for sitting down. And I appreciate you uh, sharing your wisdom about how to build businesses uh, uh, on a frugal budget. It's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun, Sarah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me. On your way out, please share the podcast with others. It's the only way that the community grows and others hear these incredible stories from entrepreneurs and top performers. And of course, pound that subscribe button so you get notified when episodes drop. 
every Friday. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and of course, your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. Have a very profitable day. You got no time to waste, but still you hesitate. Caught in a circle saying, I'll never leave this place. Ooh. Some words got you searching from the bright side over and over.